Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the best game Cox podcast on the internet. Today is Tuesday, December the 1st, 2020. On today's show, former game Cox ball player Alex McGrath joins me. He does each and every single Tuesday as we talk South Carolina's 45 to 16 loss to Georgia Bulldogs, the ongoing coaching search. We preview this weekend's game in Lexington against the Kentucky Wildcats, and much, much more here on a packed Tuesday, guys. So sit back, relax, enjoy. It's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service. They bring care and attention other companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service is what separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company, by the way. They are a moving services company and they're employee owned co op. Their movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is just as invested in the success of the project as you are. They have dedicated professional crew members and they offer black glove service. They offer end to end packing services, custom crating and packaging for special items, and cleaning services as well. They are founded by Greenville natives and University of South Carolina alumni. So, a Gamecock owned small business, they offer 20 years of project management and moving experience and they can offer logistics and solution guys that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for guys whether you're in the upstate of the state of south carolina if you have any moving needs because listen we all know what pain in the butt moving can be you lose stuff you break stuff whatever it may be you simply just don't want to do it let the guys over at upstate movers group take care of you You can find them on social media at upstate movers group or give them a call check them out on their website upstatemoversgroup.com that is upstatemoversgroup.com The show is also brought to you by our friends over at Southern Oaks Remodeling. Guys, locally and family owned, over 15 years of experience. They specialize in roofing, windows, doors, siding, and additions, and they're serving the greater Columbia area. Guys, we're in the holiday season. We officially hit December. This is the perfect time to knock out that remodeling project that you've been putting off. You can find Southern Oaks Remodeling on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Also, of course, their website, or give them a call if you got any questions. 803-899-0284. That's 803-899-0284. Guys, also another Gamecock-owned small business. Again, we're all about Gamecocks helping Gamecocks here on the Spurs Up Show. Like I said, the people are what make the difference with Southern Oaks Remodeling here in the Columbia area, locally and family-owned. Again, they know what they're doing. Over 15 years experience, and whatever it is, roofing, windows, doors, siding, whatever your remodeling project is, they will take take care of you. So again, They're on social media, their website, of course, or give them a call, 803-899-0284. That's 803-899-0284. The Spurs Up Show is also brought to you by our friends over at Yardware. Guys, Yardware is a veteran-owned and operating company licensed by the University of South Carolina, selling must-have Carolina yard and wall signs. Now, guys, these signs are made out of 12-gauge laser-cut steel, and they come in both Garnet and black. Football season's in full swing. Christmas is literally right around the corner. We finally hit December. You can order your sign today at yardwaresigns.com. They're also on social media at Yardware Signs. Guys, yet another Gamecock owned small business. These guys, University of South Carolina alumni. These signs are an absolute must have. Again, we've hit December. We're past Thanksgiving. The Christmas shopping and the Christmas madness has officially begun, guys. For the Gamecock fan in your life, this is an absolute must-have. I've got mine displayed in my studio. You guys see it all the time and all the clips that I do and all the pictures I post and all that good stuff. The detail and the quality is what really stands out with these things, guys. Get one for yourself. Get one for your boyfriend, girlfriend, mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever. The Gamecock fan in your life, they need this. And you can put it anywhere, by the way. Your yard, your studio, your office, your man cave, your garage, living room, dining room, wherever. This is a great piece and a must-have for all Gamecock fans. So again, guys, you can check them out on social media at Yardware Signs and order your sign today at YardwareSigns.com. That is YardwareSigns.com. Finally, guys, the show is brought to you by our friends over at My Bookie. Between the NFL, college football, all the major sports and more, there's no shortage of games to watch. And with thousands of lines available on all your favorite sports and events, you can turn your game day into payday with My Bookie. Now, if you're the type of person that likes to back the big favorites, consider putting a couple in a parlay for a much bigger payout. Not only guys do parlays make meaningless games exciting, but more importantly, they give you a chance to turn ordinary bets into a real moneymaker. And of course, guys, don't forget the underdogs, right? They've got a ton of value. The thing about college football, the NFL, hey, college basketball is in full swing now as well. And we know in college basketball, sports in general, but definitely college basketball, underdogs, they're never truly dogs, guys. Every team truly has a chance to win, and you do 
as well. Game spreads, championship futures, and player prop bets. It's never too late to get on the action and start turning your sports knowledge into actual cash in your wallet. Guys, you can sign up today at mybookie.ag. And when you do, use our promo code GAMECOX to claim a deposit match dollar for dollar all the way up to a thousand bucks. Guys, it's a no brainer. It's a win win. It's a bonus designed for you to give you a little help and a head start in your winning season. Guys, again, that's promo code GAMECOX, promo code GAMECOX for you to claim your bonus when you make your deposit. Stack UFC cards, college football, NFL, college basketball, guys, all the major sports and more. Sign up today to begin your winning season exclusively at my bookie. Let's get it. Tuesday, former Gamecock football player Alex McGrath. Alex, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Before we get into everything else, how was your weekend? We're talking. It's December 1st. December is here, the last month of 2020. 2020 is about to mercifully come to an end here in 31 days. But uh, how was your weekend, sir? I'm sure you watched the game and everything else, but uh, the Christmas season is here. I also ask you, how was your Thanksgiving? I know we haven't talked six, since then. So how was the uh, the holiday weekend for you? It was good, man. It was good. Had had some had a couple of family members over, fried a turkey. None of my children burned themselves on the grease or the fire, so that was a win. And of course, with you know it being December now, uh, Christmas light season has rolled around, and I forgot how much I hate putting those outside. So you know, just a, just a joyous weekend all around. So you're you're a Christmas decorations after Thanksgiving kind of guy, though. I used to be. I used to be, um, and then with the kids, they just it, it's it, it's if you can keep them out of the Christmas decorations before right. Halloween, that's a win. <laughs> so you know now it's yeah, I know that's I know that's like the it's big debate. Full force. Like, it's yeah, the big the big debates like when do you put up the tree? When do you put up the lights? It's like you know yeah, I, I saw some people on Twitter they they put up the Christmas tree the day after Halloween. I'm like I feel like that's mm-hmm. a little no. aggressive. I feel like it's a little can't aggressive. do that. Yeah, you can't look. You, you can't. You can't bastardize one holiday <laughs> in favor of another that's just the way just can't I mean, if you go it. if you want to go really down the rabbit hole we can get into a long discussion about my belief that christmas should be a floating holiday yeah. and it should always be the third friday <laughs> in december but that's a totally separate conversation <laughs> whole different podcast whole different podcast for sure. different. yeah for sure well alex let's go, let's go ahead and dive into what happened over the weekend with south Carolina football gamecocks uh, not surprisingly, falling to Georgia 45-16, to 16, really tough game. I was in the building, and it was obvious and apparent from the opening snap that South Carolina was just simply outmanned, overmatched. I want to get your initial thoughts on the game, then we'll dive into the specifics with offense, defense, all that good stuff. Did the game surprise you in any way? What were your main takeaways? Again, you're a team that you know. I'm sure you saw in pregame with all the injuries coming out. You've already got the opt-outs. I was shocked South, Car- South Carolina had enough to even field a team. At some point, I thought maybe you were going to have to go play defensive back. I mean, it really got to that Ooh. point. Um, what was your overall takeaway from the game? Were you were you surprised in any way? Did it go how you expected? What were your thoughts on the game? Uh, I, I may have I must have missed the opt outs. <clears throat> well, I'm I mean, talking about more JC Izzy and RJ Roderick, and I, I'm saying just on top of the opt outs you already had. Um, then you added in yeah. Saturday with all the you know Deshaun Fenwick had COVID. You had Jordan Birch out, J.J. Barre, Aaron Sterling, Brad Johnson, Ernest Jones goes out in the middle of the game. Like, the list just goes yeah. on and on. It was crazy. I mean, the the most shocking thing to me watching it wasn't – I mean, like, on the defensive side, like, you're missing a lot of top guys. So, getting yeah. pushed around like they did was not – I mean, it's still shocking to see because you would think our twos and threes would be able to at least somewhat hold their own mm. in there and not get nine, nine yards down the field. Um, but really like the shocking thing was the offensive line. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just a turnstile for four straight quarters. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, that, I just I haven't ever seen them get pushed around like that. It was just kind of shocking to see. Yeah, and I talked about this on my show too, Alex, because it's really tough, you know, <clears throat> in this game to take anything away from what the defense did because you were without so many key pieces. And I think at one point, man, you had like two two guys on the field who started week one, and outside of that, it was all backups. So I mean, yeah, it's hard for me to beat up on the defense when you were playing. You just weren't playing with a with a with a full deck. I mean, really. You weren't playing with all your guys. Again, opt-outs, COVID, injuries, all that stuff. You didn't have all your guys out there. So it's hard for me to pull anything away concrete from the defensive performance. Let's talk about what everybody wants to talk about, though, and that's Luke Doty. Because, I mean, that, that's the biggest takeaway from this game as far as how he performed, how the offense performed. Talking about Luke Doty, like you said, the offensive line, I was surprised, too. And give Georgia credit. Tip your cap. Then they got one of the better defenses in the entire country. And they've got a ton of great athletes up front on that defensive side. But the offensive line gave him – No time to work with. But what impressed me about Luke, and again, I want to get your takes on his entire game, but I think he threw the ball much better than people thought he would. 18 for 22, 190 yards, a touchdown and a pick. And I think I I read a stat that there's only two other quarterbacks in South Carolina history who have thrown for, I think, 80% of their passes, completed 80% of their passes, and thrown a touchdown against an SEC team. And it was Connor Shaw twice and Steven Garcia, and now Luke Doty. So, I mean, say what you want about his game. The kid showed he can spin it a little bit. And obviously, again, in the running game, we didn't get to see that quite as much because, again, Georgia was just all over him all night. Even Kevin Harris couldn't really get anything going. But your overall takeaways from Luke Doty, especially in the passing game. I mean, he's a gamer. I mean, given what he was – I mean, given he was under constant fire every time he took a snap behind center, he – he played his butt off. He just he looked really good. I mean, he's got a great feel for throwing on the run, being mobile in the pocket, feeling pressure, like and to be 18 years old and be able to do those things is incredibly positive. Yeah. I mean, he, he just looked good. I mean, he did, he wasn't able to use um, his wheels probably as much as he wanted to um, to get those bigger plays where you get way outside the pocket and you let one go down the middle or down to the sidelines. But you know, other than that, he was putting the ball in the right spots except for that one. Yeah. I, I, again, it's fresh from mistakes and it's growing pains and you can deal with it. But right. I think the yeah. biggest thing for me, Alex, with Luke Doty is he's just a guy that makes you sit up in your chair. He's a guy that makes yeah. the game exciting. And you feel like, you know, especially with your struggles on the O-line and you really have no weapons outside. I know Nick Muse had a great game, which I want to talk about in he just does. a second. But Luke Doty just gives you a chance. I mean, he really gives you a chance. I mean, I, I as much as I've, you know, been – positive about Colin Hill all season I don't know if South Carolina scores a point with Colin Hill behind center with the way Georgia was was just getting through that pass rush they had he'd have gotten killed there's no other way to put it he would have so that would have been ACL number four yeah I mean seriously so I I think with Luke Doty if nothing else he does give you a chance and I'll I'll give you a crazy uh crazy piece information I got on Saturday night Alex so on, on the show I talked about this on on yesterday's show I met up with a buddy of mine that actually works for Georgia football. He, he works personnel for Georgia, knows Bobo really well, knows Shane Beamer really well. And I know you're going to find this <clears throat> very interesting. He told me that according to what Bobo told one of the 247 writers at Georgia, Bobo has wanted Luke Doty since week two. And Shocker. one of the main reasons that he didn't play, again, because it's easy to be like must champ. They said he wasn't ready, but – it kind of like blows my mind when I think back and I'm like, if you wanted him since week two, why was he working out at wide receiver for like six weeks? Like what, what was the point of that? So I don't know, just crazy. Probably just trying to get him on the field. Yeah. Yeah. But just to hear it from him, I I thought that was really interesting in the sense that even, you know, people pile on these coaches. I mean, we all, we all do. We're all very critical. And it's like, why is this guy not out there? Why is that guy not out there? Bobo saw it too. I mean, Bobo knew like, Hey, I'm, I'm riding with Colin Hill right now, but this Luke Doty guy, he definitely is the guy that gives us the best chance to win. It's just he's just not ready to play. So, And I think you're seeing that now. I mean, I, I don't know. <clears throat> you know, it's, again, just ironic that it it finally clicked. All of a sudden, he's ready to play after Will Muschamp is fired. I, I don't know how that really – I don't know if that goes hand in hand. But, um, yeah, it, it's without a doubt. It, watch, it yeah, absolutely it, goes hand yeah, in hand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no question watching that Luke Doty by far gives this team the best chance to win this year. And I think, I think it'll probably be his job to lose going into 2021, honestly. Oh, certainly, certainly. I mean, I I mean, you're watching him grow into the job over the last 
two weeks. And so you got another opportunity this Saturday. Is it going to look any better? I don't know. I mean, if I mean, I, I assume Kentucky's pass rush isn't anywhere near what Georgia's is. So, I mean, that gives you a little bit more to work with. And, you know, we've talked about this every week, but it's just like building that confidence, being able to do it on that stage against that team in front of these people and being able to make the plays that you're executing in practice every day, like in that setting is so big going forward. And that's, I mean, people talk about like the bowl games being important and it's really always more important from a practice perspective, just because you get those reps. And so him getting these reps, even though he's running for his life back there, like you see what he can do though at the same time, you know, he can thread the needle, he can throw on the run. He can do all the things that, a, you know, a top level quarterback should be able to do in addition to the mobility and, you know, it's a shame it took eight weeks to get him into the lineup. Yeah, very much so. I'd agree. Since you brought up Kentucky, let's talk about that game a little bit because with Kentucky, you take a look at them. Their secondary is actually the strength of their defense. So I would expect you're going to see a lot of the running game with Luke Doty and Kevin Harris. And, you know, I want to see a lot of pull and play. You know what I mean? I I, I want to see a lot of RPO type game, run the football. I mean, you don't have the weapons outside. We all know that. Um, Alex, I more so want to get your take because if you, I don't know if you've ever gotten bored one day and you've looked back to the history of the South Carolina Kentucky series. I don't know why anybody would do that except for me because I'm insane. But <laughs> looking back at I'll it, when, it you, <laughs> well, when you look back at the games in Lexington, the point of it is when you look back at the games in Lexington, South Carolina has always struggled. Like even in the wins, if you go back and look, they've all been close. Like Kentucky's one of those teams. And I feel like Vandy was that way for a little bit. They always play you tough. Even when South Carolina was beating Kentucky every single year, the games have always been a struggle. And I know when you were there, you know, the, the 24 to 17, they're all close games. They're all like touchdown games, 10-point games, whatever. Talk about your experiences against the Kentucky Wildcats and specifically in Lexington. Um, what do you remember about that series? Because, again, as a South Carolina fan, player, whatever, you go into that game expecting to win. And again, you had that five-game losing streak to Kentucky, which was flat-out inexcusable. But the thing that worries me about that game is, historically, you've just been so bad in Lexington, and you see it now with the issues, the turmoil you have now. You open up as a two-touchdown underdog, which thank you, Will Muschamp, for that. You open up as a two-touchdown underdog in Lexington. But I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that series, what you remember about going to Lexington and playing the Kentucky Wildcats. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, honestly, nothing. <laughs> I mean, they had the nicest visitors locker room at that time in the SEC. Right. So that was lovely. Um, but I mean, there's not really anything to it. I can't really explain why it would be closer there. I mean, historically, we've kind of played to our competition. Right. Which, you know, is a good thing when you're keep you when you're hanging around with Georgia and Florida and Tennessee, LSU, those guys. But you know, if you're the other side of that coin is you end up hanging around the uh, Kentucky's Vanderbilt's and Wofford's of the world. Um, so I think that may have a lot to do with it. It's there, but I mean, from a memorability standpoint, there wasn't really much about like going to Lexington and playing there other than, you know, it's, it's Kentucky. The atmosphere is not going to be what it is at other sec road games. So probably them and Vanderbilt, are probably the low men on that totem pole from, uh, you know, like from an atmosphere fan environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I think, I think that kind of gives you a sense of that. We just kind of play to, uh, we've we just historically, we've always played right. to our competition. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think that I is? Have, that's <clears throat> an, if, if you figure that out, <laughs> get into the business. I, you will, you, that is, that is solving an equation that we need to solve yeah, because it doesn't happen to Bama. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, too, probably a lot of it has to do with, you know, while, you know, we have been more successful than Kentucky has been, I think Mm -hmm. from a recruiting player development standpoint until, you know, we hit that big run um, of the 11 and twos, you know, the recruiting was probably pretty close Mm -hmm. to what, you know, they were getting, and then from a facility standpoint, especially at that time, you know, up until uh, probably three, four years ago, the facilities were pretty similar too. So 
I think that kind of all factored into it where, you know, they were probably, they were better than their records would probably indicate on a year in and year out basis. So it was just probably more of an equivalent matchup than anybody really wanted to talk about. And that probably has a lot to do with it. Yeah, for sure. Now you, now you talk recruiting, which leads me to the coaching search, which is what everybody wants to talk about. Let, let's face it. I, I was joking with somebody over the weekend. Let's just get like, to it. Let's yeah. Get I'm to like, it. I'm like, man, I, I was joking with somebody though, but I'm serious. I'm like, man, every piece of content we put out that's about the coaching search. I mean, it just, it just blows up. I mean, people just, they want to know who the next head football coach is going to be. And obviously we have a lot to talk about today. That is, it's all rumor right now, but like I just told you, and I think everybody's pretty much seen it at this point, rumors swirling about Shane Beamer. And that's the lead candidate. Let's, let's not dance around it. Shane's the lead candidate. When you start hearing things about financials being in place, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's a lot of smoke when you start talking about money numbers. Um, four years, $3 million per is what is rumored for Shane Beamer. And I, I'm assuming Shane would not say no to that um, on, any, in any, on any planet. I don't think he's going to say no. Um, no. But just talk about, again, if you've heard anything, whatever, I, I, everything I'm hearing points to Shane Beamer being the next head football coach. And I don't know if it was the day of or maybe it was a day after um, Alex, after we spoke last week, but obviously, again, the outpour of support continues for Shane Beamer. Marcus Lattimore going on public record and giving that vote of confidence. And again, you've seen Devontae Holloman, Steven Garcia, DJ Swearinger, Patrick DeMarco. I mean, the names keep going on. The best to ever wear the garnet in black. And I was telling, I was talking to somebody about this over the weekend, Tori Gurley, good buddy of mine, former player. And I was telling him, I said, Tori, no offense. I don't think South Carolina should do everything that you guys say. I don't think South Carolina should do everything that the greatest players of all time at South Carolina say. But, but with that being said, man, it is hard to completely ignore the support that Shane Beamer is getting for this job. And I mean, listen, I've talked to a ton of former players, obviously on my show, guys I've had on there talking about the culture, getting the culture back, getting that back in the building, getting a guy who knows what it's about, getting a guy in Shane Beamer who's seen South Carolina at its best. He understands what that culture is like. Um, I guess just overall, again, your thoughts on everything we're hearing right now. Because, again, like I said, it feels like right now it's all aboard the Shane train. I, I think all signs are pointing towards Shane Beamer. Yes, I've heard a little Neil Brown. Yes, I've heard maybe some Jamie Chadwell talk. Billy Napier's name continues to come up, obviously. But, man, I'll tell you right now, I'll tell you right now, Alex, if I had to put money on it, I'd be shocked if South Carolina did not hire Shane Beamer as their head coach. I would too. Um, there's a there's a part of me. So, looking at like you know, the guys you just mentioned that have endorsed Beamer, and and being a Beamer endorser myself, yeah. You know, I, I'm not. I don't think anybody's saying like you've got to only listen to these guys, mm. right? It's you know we we have to do what the you know former greats of the field said that we have to do. That, that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's really just if you're looking at the candidates in totality like guys that have been in the locker room with him and been on the field with him and been coached by him certainly have an advantage in knowing like what he brings to the table that, you know, general message board trolls don't know, (laughs) you know, they're just going to look at, well, he's never been a head coach. So clearly he's a failure. No, that's not how that works. And, you know, bringing that culture back, I don't even know that it's really the culture. It's just, you know, there, there seems to have been, or at least on the interwebs, you know, there seems to be this whole thing floating around where, you know, it turned into a me first mm-hmm. thing where, you know, the players were just kind of out on their own and doing their own thing. And the only thing that was kind of keeping them together was the coaching staff bringing them to practice and bringing them to meetings. And it's about bringing even more so than the coach bringing the culture, it's bringing in the guys that fit that and not just everybody you can get. And so I think, you know, Shane's got an advantage in that because he was here at the foundation of the height of the program. Yeah. And he knows what that looks like. He knows how to run that. He knows exactly what they were doing to foster that kind of growth. And I think that is something that's invaluable to bring to the table because every time you know, I read something where, you know, it's stupid to hire somebody without head coaching experience or that's even been a coordinator. 
you know, we were talking before we started, you know, Butch Jones had a great record in Cincinnati. Jim McElwain was an excellent coach at Colorado state. And the, I mean, the list can go on and on and on about, you know, grabbing guys from mid-major programs that have had some success. I mean, honestly, if you're going to ride that train, on the head coaching record, Jamie Chadwell is should be everybody's number one because it wasn't just one place that he won. He won at yeah. multiple stops at multiple levels. So, I mean, if you want to go that route with it, it's got to be Chadwell. But at the end of the day, what we need, in my opinion, is somebody that can come in that knows our situation better than, you know, Napier's going to know it, then Chadwell's going to know it, then Hugh Freeze is going to know it know what we're up against, how to work within that system of disadvantages to maximize the product that you're putting on the field. And Shane knows how to do that. Yeah, and, and I was going to say this too, as far as the, the former players speaking out, whatever. Maybe that wouldn't be such a big factor normally. But to me, the way I look at it, Alex, is unless there's a guy out there who is just a clear-cut better option than Shane. And again, we've talked about the Urban Myers and the Bob Stoops yeah. of the world. But realistically, when you, when you take a look at the short list of, and I don't even think Hugh Freeze is on the short list anymore. I just don't think South Carolina would go that either. direction. But when you're talking about guys like Shane Beamer, Billy Napier, Jamie Chadwell, unless Napier or Chadwell just destroy the interview and they are just head and shoulders that much better of a candidate than him, if it's an even playing field, why would you not go with the guy that's got the endorsement of the greatest players to ever step foot on your campus? like? Because you know what? I guess if nothing else, like, heck, I don't know. Hey, people have said, hey, we're going to find ourselves here in four or five years. We're going to be doing this all over again. Guys, it doesn't matter who the next head coach is. If you don't win, we are going to be here in five years. That's how college football works. You, you don't get 10 years to build a program anymore. You're seeing it all yeah. over college football, right? Look at Jeremy Pruitt, probably about to lose his job. I mean, it, it happens everywhere. So, like, that, that Shane, it's not just exclusive to Shane Beamer. Like, Whatever. No, yeah. You're going to roll the dice no matter what. And I guess that's my point. And if you're going to roll the dice, like I was telling you off air, Alex, if you're going to roll the dice, why not roll it with the guy that's cut his teeth at USC? Why not roll it with the guy who, you know, has been here and done that? I mean, I understand Napier's head coaching experience, but, and I, and I don't want the Clemson thing to be like a big factor in why you don't hire him, but it's kind of like, I don't know, man, like who would I rather take? The guy all the former players want and love and he was at USC or the guy who got fired by Davo Sweeney from Clemson. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't ride no, with the guys, I mean, you know. So. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that's a good point. It, it's just the, the takes on the internet are dumb. And I've seen it from like pr more prominent people than I would <laughs> like to see it from. <laughs> Just, you know, like that somehow not being a head coach before is some like huge detriment. Right. Against it's becoming, him. Like, he, like it's becoming more and more common. And I'll tell you this, not not to cut you off. My buddy that I, I didn't I don't think I mentioned this on the Monday show. My buddy that I talked to that works at Georgia, you know, because Kirby had never been a head coach, right? Kirby had never been a head coach. Nope. When he got the Georgia job. We were talking about the whole Shane B. He, Fully endorses Shane Beamer, by the way. Again, a good buddy of mine. I don't think he just blows smoke up my ass. He worked with Beamer at, at, in Athens, right? No, He knows yeah. Shane Beamer very well. And he basically said, hey, man, Shane's going to be your next head coach, just, just so you know. So, I mean, I think it's going to happen. But he was talking about Shane Beamer, and he was, we were talking about Kirby. And he's like, bro, that's where college was. He's like, bro, people think Kirby calls his own defense. He's like, do you really think Kirby calls his own defense? Absolutely no. not. No, he's like – I've been in the meeting rooms till midnight. You know who's in there? The defensive coordinator. You know who's not in there? Kirby. He's not there. So, I mean, yeah. that CE – and I, I know people get tired of – and I've seen people saying, God, I hope I never hear the word culture again or CEO type fit again. And I know it's overused, but really, like, that's the way college football is going now. The head coach is just the talking head, the CEO type. Get some great coordinators in there. Let them work for you. I think that's one thing Muschamp was never able to do. He couldn't get out of his coordinator's way. Let these guys work. You pay them a no. lot of money. You pay them a lot of money. Let them do their job. Exactly. So, and you be the head piece exactly. that recruits and, it's, and sells the program. That's the, And that's it, man. And that's what Shane's going to be. And it's like, we don't – like, you're paying these guys to do this job. Let them do it. Like, there's too much on your plate to run a program for you to get bogged down at midnight 
in the defensive meeting room. Right. Like that's insane. Like you're yeah. like his time is better spent recruiting or putting stuff yeah. together that they want to look at anything of that nature. Like that's your job mm-hmm. is to make sure that all those pieces fit together in the right way to give you the most success. Yeah. And I think he's got a unique perspective on that. And, and you are the CEO of the, of the organization. Again, people get tired of hearing that, but bro, it's not just you're selling the program to recruit. Hey, you got to deal with boosters. You got to deal with the president and the AD. Mm-hmm. That's not something the assistants deal yep. with. You got There's a lot yep. of moving pieces there as a head football coach in 2020 and moving to 2021 that head coaches maybe didn't have to deal with 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It's a lot different now. Like It's a lot different, yes. especially the way you have to recruit. That's why Spurrier got out of the game. He didn't want to recruit. He didn't want to do it. So, he didn't want to do it when he was at Florida, though. Well, but he didn't have to. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it, the game has changed. Yeah. You know, he 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 thought it was going to be like at Florida where it's like, hey, we're winning. I'm Steve Spurrier. Come here. Boom. I don't have to say another word. And at Florida, that worked. And in South Carolina, obviously, it did not because that's just not how it works. And I guess that's kind well, of a funny thing. You know when it did work, though? When's that? <laughs> when Shane came on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah. Well, Shane was the one busting his ass recruiting. Yeah, I mean, he, he I'm Spurrier let his assistants recruit for him. I just think Correct. at some point it kind of caught up in the sense where it's like you're so uninvolved. You know what I mean? You're so uninvolved where, like, it's going to be tough to, you know, five-star guy yeah. comes on campus and you don't even know his name. That, that's a tough look. That was a tough look. A that tough was a tough look. look. Yes. But tough look. getting back to – and it's funny because we're talking out the whole recruiting side of it. And in my head I'm like, I understand Shane Beamer's never been a head coach, but do you think a recruit that we're going to go after – really gives a damn if Billy Napier sells the fact he was a head coach at Louisiana or if Jamie Chadwell sells that he was a head coach at Coastal. Those kids don't care. They don't care about that. What does it matter? What difference does it make? Like it doesn't, I don't know. I, I think we're just, here's the thing. Cause I think people want me to like pick one guy and say, everybody else sucks. And I I guess that's just the nature of the internet, right? It's the hot take central. And cause in, in my takes, I've always been very much, you know, I guess, strong in my opinion and stuff like that but it's kind of funny with this coaching search man unless you went and hired a jeff munkin which you're not going to like whether it's whether it's freeze napier beamer um chadwell neil brown i'm kind of like i'm gonna get behind the next guy no matter what like i don't think any of those are terrible hires i don't so that's and that's and that's the thing that's why i don't understand people freaking out to beamer because it's like we're splitting hairs guys like they're all going to be a risk. We're rolling the dice no matter who we hire. I mean, so. I mean, the, kind of, and again, we've talked about this before, but I mean, the floor so on much those higher. three. So much higher. Like compared yeah. to where we were is refreshing at yeah. best. Yeah. No, because sure. I, I don't, I mean, I don't get the Beamer thing either. I mean, it's, just, it's it, it, I mean, it is what it is, but I, I mean, I think it's incredibly short-sighted. Yeah. And again, normally it's like, Normally, I guess, like, you wouldn't – the the former players coming out endorsing him the way they have, maybe that wouldn't be the lead storyline or the lead thing we're talking about in regards to this coaching search. But isn't it a little intoxicating? I, I mean, God, I mean, you got all these guys – they're the best players to ever wear it. Best players to ever do it. It's hard not to listen to them, man. It's very hard. Very hard. I agree. I mean, I mean what other endorsement – again, guys that were in the room with him. Right. that have been coached by him that were recruited ultimately by him. Like they know what he is in the living room. They know what he is on the field. Like they know all of that stuff. And that's where they want the program to go. Obviously it's where I want the program to yeah. go. And you know, the, the vitriol, I, I just don't, I don't get it, but it, yeah. such is life. Right. Well, and, and I, I'll say this to Alex in closing it's almost gotten to the point for me, man, that, like I said, unless you have a candidate in mind that is just like, you know, maybe Napier just, I mean, completely just crushes the interview. And he's just like, you, you know, Tanner and Casson leave that meeting. They're like, we can't hire anybody else. Like, unless it's that type of scenario, it's almost like to me, if you don't hire Beamer, you're almost kind of spitting in those guys' faces in, in a way. I, and that is not the scenario we want to or need to be in. Nope. I, I like you keep like crushing the interview. Well, like what what is crushing? I, I don't know. Well, see, I don't know. Like, like, I, I don't know. Even... I don't know. It's just unless you, I'm saying, unless they meet with a guy and you leave that meeting and you're like, we got to have that guy as our next coach. It's just it's it, no doubt we have to have him. I don't know what that would 
pertain to necessarily. I don't know if he gives a Lou Holtz-esque speech. I don't know. I don't know what it would be, but that's what I'm saying. If it's like, okay, all three are equal in the interview process, we're going to go with our guy. I mean, bottom line. And that was, yeah. I think that's my biggest I mean, thing. Unless he, unless... Yeah, I was just going to say, that's my biggest thing. What I've told people is like, bro, I don't, I mean, I do care who South kind of hires, but again, we're splitting hairs. I would just say, if I could say one message to Castle and Tanner and the search committee, hey, I don't give a damn what nobody on Twitter says or social media or the stats. If you think he's the guy, go with it. Pull the trigger. Whatever. Roll the dice. Let's do it. Don't second guess it. If you think Beamer's the guy, just do it. Don't listen to what anybody says because you know that the media is going to come out and talk shit and you're going to have different radio hosts and personalities and podcasts and Twitter and message board. Who gives a damn? You make the hire you think's the best fit and we'll go from there. Bottom line, don't let anybody... Because, again, like I told you last week, people tweeting out stats of, like, this is how first-time head coaches in the SEC. Bro, according to the stats, we should never win the SEC. So who really gives a damn what the stats say? What, what does it matter? You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's this, the, the, the statistics you presented or that were presented were to frame an argument on why Shane shouldn't be hired. But, it, it, but you can make the stats say whatever they want. I mean – yeah, there's there's gonna be failures everywhere. Uh, a la Derek Mason just mm-hmm. got axed at Vanderbilt, who would be an outstanding defensive coordinator for us going forward for whatever yeah. that's worth. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it's I don't know. I, I mean, unless like Napier and Chadwell or Brown walked in there and said, "Hey, I've got you know this forty billion dollar hedge fund that's gonna back me to buy players," <laughs> I, I don't know what they're gonna say that gives them a leg up on somebody that's been in the program put together some of the best recruiting classes the program's ever seen i it, just because he's never had a w tag to his name yeah yeah no i agree i agree and again i we're, hey we're, we're talking here on a tuesday this shows out on a tuesday from what we've heard this thing could be going down sooner than we think but i i tweeted this morning it's not a question of if it's a question of when i think at this point so Hey, all aboard the Shane train. If you're not, just buckle up. I think that's kind of the direction we're going. Uh, In closing here, Alex, before we go, I want to pose this question to you and get your insight because somebody asked me this on my daily live stream, but I want to get your insight because you're a player. You've been to a bowl game, right? You've been to multiple bowl games. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me, oh, you know, and I know the season's been rough, man. There's no question. Obviously, look at the record. Look at everything that's happened. They said, oh, my God, why would you even want to go to a bowl game for South Carolina this year? Because, you know, everybody basically is getting in, right? Tell right. people the – because I, I, I understand why it's valuable for guys like Luke Doty and Pickens and Birch and Harris, all these youngsters. But just tell people – try to explain to people the value of going to a bowl game, the extra practices, playing an opponent you don't normally get to play, how valuable that could be for this South Carolina team, even with all the turmoil, getting a new head coach, especially for a guy I would say like Luke Doty. I think that experience, those extra reps, they're invaluable. It's huge. You get 20 extra practices to go through the reps. You get another opponent to go out there and play against. And two, for the seniors, yeah, how, whichever ones are still left, um, mm-hmm. for the seniors, like you get one more chance to put a helmet on. And that's what's invaluable. I mean, like, look, you know, I, you know, sure. So 2008 or no, I guess it was January 1st, 2009 was my last game Outback Bowl, right? And sure, like, did I have aspirations of, like, trying to make Arena League rosters and stuff like that? Yeah, I did. But then, of course, all that folded in the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is, like, at some point in every, all those players' lives, they're going to be told they can't put a helmet on anymore. Right. And to give them the opportunity to do it one more time is huge. It's huge because you get to do it one more time with your teammates and your friends. And on top of that – the extra practices that you get and the extra reps that you get, all of that stuff is invaluable going into spring ball next year where you've gotten, you know, for Luke, especially, you know, instead of getting 80 snaps at quarterback, now he's got 206 or uh, 160 snaps yeah. at quarterback. And like, that's a big difference. That's yeah. an extra game that he gets to play under center that he wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Yeah. And for everybody, all of the young guys, mm-hmm. all of them, yeah, that experience is invaluable, man. Like you said, people don't realize all those extra practices. You can't simulate game day reps in practice. So getting another game day, no, it only helps. Especially like I, I think of it as just like, man, like I don't give a damn if we lose the bowl game by 50, but 
I mean, I do, but I don't care if we lose the bowl game, but just getting Luke Doty more snaps when he's probably going to be your starter next year, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Like, it makes sense. It is. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Again, I don't know. I think this game could, you know, sway that one way or the other. I don't know if a 2-8 and eight South Carolina is going to get – selected I, I have no idea because the bowl the whole bowl thing is pure madness this year but we'll have to wait and see but alex man appreciate you taking the time as always like i said man this this coaching search thing is swirling so uh we might have to do an emergency show if, if any <laughs> any breaking news drops this week that, that might have to happen I, I don't know so you just you just let me know <laughs> and if and if we hire ron zook we can burn oh, all of God. our south carolina oh, gear God. in effigy somewhere oh please just anything but another florida head coach just at least for one coaching cycle please for the love of god um let us be unless it's urban I unless it's like urban unless it's urban <laughs> correct correct alex man always a pleasure we'll do it again uh, next week for sure all right buddy thanks man Absolutely. He's Alex McGrath. I'm Chris Swilts. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you next time with an episode of the Spurs Up Show.